and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, Annually, we host over 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can find us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. To introduce today's archaeology event, featuring Dr. Peter Feynman, I'll be sharing a message from the chair of our archaeology committee, Michelle Kidwell Gilbert. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, and welcome today's audience to a special online program. It is special for two reasons. Last April, Peter Feynman was supposed to discuss Jerusalem before King David, but the National Arts Club closed its doors mid-March with Peter's event postponed. How our world has altered since then with the scourge of this COVID plague. It is also special because this program provides needed context to understand the interplay of populations and nations more fully. Peter Feynman received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, both the master's in education and MBA from New York University and doctorate in education from Columbia University. Founder and president of the Institute of History Archaeology and Education, a nonprofit organization which provides enrichment programs for schools, professional development programs for teachers, as well as public programs. He is the author of the recently published Jerusalem Throne Games, the Battle of Bible Stories after the Death of David, and serves on the board of the American Research Center in Egypt, New York chapter. I am giving this introduction out of Manhattan, where I hope to return shortly and subsequently moderate the question portion, either from my apartment in New York or the National Arts Club itself. I have oftentimes spoken about the ability of archeology span to demonstrate shared humanity and offer a path for our highly conflicted times, replete with abounding hatreds between people. No place has demonstrated decency and a respect for culture to a broad audience more finely than the Arts Club itself. This is thanks to our president, Alice Palmisano, executive director, Ben Hartley, manager, John Aramo, Nadine Heidinger handling programs, and Mitch Case, the technical aspects, as well as the rest of our wonderful, highly professional staff, the board, various committees and extraordinary members, many of whom view the club as an extension of their own family. From lectures about archeology, span architecture, film, literature, music, Shakespeare, theater, and so much else involving international experts. The National Arts Club has been the preeminent venue for instruction highlighting universal beauty and lessons about civilized values which enhance life itself. Yes, we are a club dedicated to the arts with a national thrust, but the National Arts Club functions not just for itself, but also for a global audience enriched by its diverse online offerings. I and the entire archeology span committee are honored to be part of this endeavor. Peter, if you will. Thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. And thank you to the National Arts Club for making this lecture possible. I also would like to thank the Rye Free Library where I am sitting right now. This is the library our Archaeology Society uses for our own lectures and for their Zoom license, and we appreciate their support. And I wanna thank all of you for registering and for signing up today to hear this talk. So if we can get started with the slides, with the PowerPoint, 
that I sent you, then I can begin the lecture. Okay, this you've heard, so the next one, please. So this is the abstract that I submitted to Michelle about what I would be speaking about. So I'm just gonna read it for you. Jerusalem existed longer before it became the city of David than it did as the capital of his kingdom. Contrary to popular comparison of David choosing the city for his capital as the founding fathers chose the city of Washington, Jerusalem was a living city with centuries old history. What do we know about that history? What do we know about its religion? How did it respond to the presence of the new people Israel? What happened to the people after they became part of Israel? What impact did these people have on the Bible? I can't address all of that in this talk, but I can get started on that and give you a background for that. Next, please. So when you have a, a talk about the topic we're having today, there are certain context and background that needs to be clarified. The first is, who's this David person that we're talking about? What you see on the screen are five possibilities that biblical scholars have created to understand and define David. The first one highlighted in red, David was king of Judah and Israel, is the traditional approach following the biblical narrative and the approach I will be taking in this talk. But as you can see, there are other possibilities. David was king of Judah, but not Israel. Or David was king of Israel, but not Judah. David never was a king. He was a chieftain. And David never was. It's all a hoax. So these are the different views that scholars have. You could invite five people, sit them at a panel, and maybe have five different views. So I will be following this first one in red. Next, please. Now I want to go into this common, at least in the American audience, portrayal of Washington versus the city of David. It has some validity to it, but overall, I would say it's not really a good comparison. The city of Washington was founded on uninhabited land. Nobody lived there. By contrast, Jerusalem was centuries old, even a millennia old, before it became the city of David in the capital of Israel. Washington was always part of the United States. The land that that city is on had been part of the United States since the country was founded. But Jerusalem only became part of Israel under David. It had an independent history prior to that. Next, please. Another difference is Washington remained the capital of the United States right to today. But Jerusalem was not always the capital of Israel or even of the kingdom of Judah after the split, after Solomon. When Congress first met in 1800 in Washington, DC, that was 24 years after America became independent. But when David became king in Jerusalem, Israel had already been around for centuries. I see a, a notice there about Native Americans, so I can answer that while it's timely. There, there were none at that time. It's possible earlier there had been, but in 1800 and 1776, it was empty land. Next, please. So another question to address is, what does it mean to be the capital of a country? I'm giving you two examples here from American history. At the left, you see the post office here in Manhattan that is now repurposed into a train station. 
And I'm including that there because that was the most common way anybody in the 13 states would have been aware that there was a capital, that there was a country. Because these post offices were located all over the place. In fact, I can look out the window now and see the Boston Post Road, which was the road used for the posts, for the mailings in the British terminology from New York to Boston. So there's nothing like that in the Kingdom of Israel. There's no Israelite presence from the capital in all the different communities. And on the right, you see the Custom House, the Alexander Hamilton Custom House in Lower Manhattan. Now this was a typical way the state, United States, did make its presence known collecting customs. There were no taxes then. So it earned its money mainly from these revenues from uh, imported goods. Now it's possible that after David and you had more extensive trading that the kingdom did under Solomon earn custom revenues, the equivalent of that as the copper mines were expanded in what is now or what was Edom. But by and large, if you were in any of the areas in Israel after David made Jerusalem the capital, you wouldn't have noticed anything different the next day. Next, please. So here you're looking at a very deceptive map of the land of Canaan. Why do I call this deceptive? Well, I'm speaking to you from Westchester. We have about 45 different municipalities here. They all have very clear cut boundary lines. So I'm in Rye, and you know if you cross over into Harrison or then to White Plains and so on. There are clear lines there and there's, there's not a wall, but at least you know when you're changing jurisdictions. This map is deceptive and it gives the impression that it's the same in ancient Canaan, but it wasn't. Most of what you see there is really empty space around those white circles with the names of cities. Now there would be some villages in there that aren't shown on this map, but it's much more like driving in upstate New York where you're on one of the roads and you go through a town and you see a post office and a steeple and a village hall and then you drive 10 miles to the next one and there's nothing in between. That's more like what you had there in ancient Canaan. And you certainly didn't have sharp boundary lines where you know you're crossing from one to the other. Another thing to remember or to be aware of is that people would identify based on their city. So again, you look at those white circles and some of the squares. If you ask somebody, who are you? Identify yourself. They would tell you the name, they're Jerusalem, they're Shechem, they're Megiddo, whatever. No one would say, I'm a Canaanite. There was no such thing as a kingdom of Canaan. So you identified based on your municipality, your village, your town, your city. The people who use the term Canaan, for the most part, are two. At the last half of the second millennium BCE, Egypt used that term because it ruled this entire land. No one had done that before them. Then it used the term Canaan to refer to it more or less as an administrative district within the empire. And then moving ahead into the first millennium, Israel uses it in the writing of the Bible. You see the phrase Canaan there quite often. But in the second millennium, only Egypt did and the people locally did not use it. Also at no point, not only was there no kingdom, but these cities really never conquered other cities, created empires or confederations. They just did not have the military logistical capability of doing that. They might have conflicts, border conflicts, raids, but you didn't really have confederations or federations or small empires at this time. Next, please. So what did these cities have? By and large, a city would have these four characteristics. They would have a king, 
they would have a temple, perhaps the Baal, not necessarily, but most likely. They would have walls around the city, not the whole area, but just the city, gates to enter the city, and they would have controlled access to water, whether it was a well or a stream or maybe even through a tunnel. What changed when these cities became part of Israel is you eliminate the king. All these cities that had kings during the second millennium did not have kings after David into the first millennium. So you can sort of cross that off the list. I guess I could have made up another slide for that, but I didn't. Next, please. Now, what I didn't show is besides water, we need to keep in mind food. So in that surrounding area, sometimes the hinterland or the daughter villages, that's where the food was grown for the city. So I'm showing you a market there on the left, and we know markets are uh, popular now with local produce, not from the supermarket. And uh, that's pretty much how the people in the city would eat. They would get food from their daughter villages. Uh, not necessarily every day, but there would be market days. The example on the right is what you really would not have. Now in January, I got oranges from Florida. Well, that's a long way to ship fresh fruit. You didn't really have that in ancient times. So the people would primarily get the food that was available locally from the hinterland in the surrounding areas to their city. Next. So this is the evidence that I will be using in the rest of the talk. There are two different types. There's archeology span and there's textual evidence. The archeology span on the left, the first one will be the Middle Bronze Age. But if you look at it, these are all BCE. You look at the dates, you see it's not continuous. So many of you are familiar with excavations at sites where you have these uh, strata and you have very detailed layer by layer excavations tracing the history over centuries or millennia. But Jerusalem hasn't had that kind of archeology span as a living city, as a city with the Temple Mount. So we have these gaps in the archeological record. On the right, you have textual information. Now, some of that is in part archeological, meaning these texts had to be discovered archeologically. And the ones in the red both come from Egypt. So they were found there. The first one that we'll come to was also written in Egypt. The second one are copies of letters that were written outside of Egypt. And we'll come to that. So these are letters some cases written in Jerusalem. We don't have the copy from Jerusalem, but we have the copy from their files in Egypt. And the final text will be some biblical texts, uh, mainly from Judges and a little bit in the book of Samuel about David. Next, please. So here's Jerusalem. When I'm talking about the city of David, let me see if I can move my cursor there. Can you see on Mount Zion? That's the area in the city of David. No, not new Mount Zion, Mount Zion to the right. Uh, Mount Zion in that reddish brown type area, that's part of the city of David. And it's still there uh, today. If you look at the green part north of that, that is the part that would be added afterwards. You see the palace, temples, and so on. The yellowish brown part to the left was not part of the city. It became part of the city hundreds of years later after Assyria destroyed the Northern Kingdom of Israel. It took some of those people, it deported them, the so-called 10 lost tribes. Some of the people remained in Israel on the land, and some became refugees. So there was this vast expansion in Jerusalem at that time. So these are Israelites moving south from the kingdom of Israel, now destroyed, or part of Assyria, into Jerusalem. And that changes the demographics. 
because prior to that, mostly what you had was the people in to the right of that, where it says Mount Zion, the traditional residents of the city, the Jebusites. Next, please. So here's a map. Well, here's a photograph of it and a drawing of it. Uh, with the map on the left, you can see in the yellow highlight, some of the evidence that I was talking about, the large stone uh, structure and the stone step structure and the spring there that it protects. So you can see also there's a valley and that's what made the city of David and the old city of Jerusalem gave it its, uh, its protection from threats. The only access really was to the north where you see the Temple of Mount, uh, not from the east and the west where there were valleys. On the right, you have an artist's reconstruction of what it would look like around the time of David and Solomon. And you can see those stone step structures again, which I highlighted some of them and the, and the, uh, uh, and the well as also with the temple all the way up at the top on the right. So this is giving you some idea of what the city would have looked like uh, in the time of David. And it also explains why you can't do all the excavations that you could do at say Megiddo and some of the other sites, because you have people living in the city of David portion of it right now, and you have the Temple Mount in, in the other portion. So it's very difficult. Next, please. Now I'm showing you some slides of where the Israelites lived when they first appeared in history. They did not live in those cities that I showed you in the earlier slides. They lived on the hilltops and pretty much where no one had been before. As part of that, they created these terraces that you see on the left. And it's quite possible some of those terraces continue to be in use today. Because that's really the best way you have to grow anything on these hilly uh, sites. On the right, you see a modern reconstruction of what an Israelite dwelling would look like called the four room house. Now it looks like there are more rooms because they've divided some of the rooms into parts. On the left, you can see a dividing line uh, in the middle and on the right as well. The center is like a courtyard where the animals could be brought in at night. And in the back, you have a long room, a broad room that goes all the way across. There's a full-size model, if you're ever up at the uh, Semitic Museum in, um, in, in Harvard, they have a full-scale, full-size reconstruction. So you can see what these two-story homes would have looked like. And these are Israelite homes. And you had hundreds of these, which I will come back to again in, in a few slides. Next, please. So the Israelite one can now be contrasted with the Canaanite settlements. These sites prior to David, there's no king in them. There's no temple. There's no wall. There's no gates. And there's no controlled access to water. So it's a completely different lifestyle than the Canaanite cities. They really are in parallel tracks. Now, eventually there would be a king, but not in one of these hilltop settlements, but in fact, in one of the Canaanite cities, Jerusalem. Next, please. So now we're switching to that evidence I was talking about. When you excavate in Jerusalem for whatever purpose, non-archeological, commercial, you dig down, you're gonna find something. It's a little bit like, I guess it's maybe 20 years ago now in lower Manhattan when they were building a federal office and they dug down and found the African burial ground, which had been there all along, but it had been buried over the years. So in this case, they were going to build a visitor center and they found these what are called cyclopean rocks as if only cyclops could pick them up and put them there. And I think you can see the person um, standing there towards the right to give you some sense of scale. Um, 
between the, the size of the rocks and this person. Next, please. So they decided that let's incorporate what we discovered underground into our visitor center. And that's what they did. And you can see that here in the railings. So again, no matter where you excavate, you're gonna find something. And in this case, these gates, well, I'll show you an artist drawing of it, are dated roughly 3,800 years ago into the Middle Bronze Age, as I was showing you on that earlier slide on the evidence. Next. So here you have an artist's reconstruction of what that would have looked like when it was originally built. And you see a couple of people standing at the walls on top, on the right and the left. Now I wanna make the point that there's nothing particularly unusual about that. You could have a drawing like this from many different cities throughout the land of Canaan. This is what they did. Well, now, not all the time, but certainly in the first early Bronze Age, the middle Bronze Age, cities protected themselves, protected their access to water, and they built gates. So th this is not Egypt on the Nile, and it's not Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. It's a different ecology, a different landscape, a different environment where you have to protect your sources of water. And that's what you're gonna see on the next slide. Next, please. So on the right, you can see Gion. And if some of you have been to Israel and been to Jerusalem, you've probably gone there. You may have taken pictures there. Uh, the Gion Spring is still active. It's this perennial source of water that periodically gushes that made it possible to have people live there. You need a perennial source of water, and this was it. The gate that you can see on the uh, left, you see the spring tower built over Guillaume Spring. So if the gates are meant to protect, control access to the water. You see a little further up the stepstone structure that I will show you actual slides of later on. But that shows you how the city's also grown in height through landfill, through garbage as the city gets higher and higher. So the spring is at the lower side, at the lower depths, and it's being protected there by the gate. Next, please. So now we're gonna switch over from the archeology span to the textual evidence that we have from Egypt. We're going to the execration text. That just means cursing. Next. And I call it voodoo because pretty much that's what it was. The Egyptian pharaoh would make up these uh, figurines or would, they would be made up for pharaoh and there would be writing on it, names of people uh, uh, or of locations. And then through a ceremony, the figurine would be smashed. By smashing the figurine with the name of your enemy on it, you are officially declaring your rule, your dominance over them. This was not necessarily accompanied by any military action against them. So it's a form of, of magic in that sense. That's why they're called execration texts or cursing. And it's in these texts that we find what generally scholars believe to be the first mention of Jerusalem. And you see that there on the right. Now, how long had Egyptians been doing this? There's no way of knowing. Just because we have figurines from around the 19th century, Pharaoh Senwazra III, doesn't mean it's the first time they did it. it. Just means it's around the first time we have it. And that's just the luck of archeology. span so we have what looks like information proving the city of Jerusalem exists even before that visitor center was excavated and we found archeological evidence for the city there. Next, please. Now I'm gonna skip ahead several hundred years, again, showing we do not have continuous information about the sites. 
So we're going down to the 14th century BCE to the Amarna letters. Next, please. Now these letters were discovered by chance by an Egyptian peasant woman out farming, working the fields. And she came across the equivalent of what is a diplomatic file cabinet that had been left by Agnaton or Tutankhamun when the capital was relocated from Amarna it's during the Agnaton age, the age of the heresy king. And when they pulled out, they seemed to have left this file cabinet or the equivalent of a file cabinet of diplomatic correspondence just covering 10 to 15 years. Now, in some ways it's great to have it. In some ways it's very frustrating because it tells you that there's got to be more and we just don't have it and probably never will after it was relocated. Even the ones we have, much of it was destroyed. Because when they first found it in Egypt in 1886, uh, a lot of them, when they were transporting them for sale in the market, crumbled. So we don't even have all the original letters that would have been found back then. We only have a sample of it uh, because they realized there was value to these letters. Now the letters are written in cuneiform script. I wanna differentiate the script and the language. So this shows you that even though we're in Egypt, they're using a Mesopotamian script. The language is mainly Akkadian, but partly Canaanite. And there are scholars who make a specialty of studying that and trying to see how the people in Canaan adapted the language for their own use. Because prior to this, there was no written language in, in the land of Canaan. We don't have evidence for that. So they are learning this international language uh, for this correspondence in the 14th century. They are part of the Egyptian empire at this time. But when they write it, they throw in some local terminology. And as I say, scholars study that to differentiate the Canaanite language from the Akkadian language, all written in the cuneiform script found in Egypt. So this tells us that there were scribes in Jerusalem. There were people who could write in Jerusalem in the 14th century. It's not an alphabet though, but they were able to write. Now we learned some, <clears throat> excuse me, some other things about this. The diplomatic correspondence is coming from a king of Jerusalem. So we know not only was there a city, but it had a king, Abdi Hebda. Again, scholars try to figure out who is this person? What is his name ethnically? He's not quite sure what, but it may not be from the area of Canaan. He may have been from an outside area who became the king of Jerusalem. Because in the letter, he refers to the strong arm of the Egyptian king. So that strong arm placed him on the throne. And biblical scholars, of course, know that the strong arm of the Lord is what delivered Israel from Egypt during the Exodus. So you probably have a phrase that already existed in Egyptian terminology, but instead of being applied to Pharaoh, the biblical writers are applying it to their own deity. Now, what is being requested in these letters, in this diplomatic correspondence? Well, a couple of things are of interest. One is we learned that there were Nubian troops garrisoned in Jerusalem in the 14th century. So that means there were Nubians in Jerusalem before there were Israelites in Jerusalem. So that's probably not as well known to many people. We also see they're asking for help. They're asking for 50 archers. That's not a lot of people, small scale. And they're asking for archers because they're being threatened. There's some external force called the Heperu, not the Israelites and not the Hebrews, the Heperu, who are threatening the city and they want Pharaoh to come to the rescue. What these letters also show is that there were extensive rivalries among those Canaanite cities. 
So if you look back at that earlier slide with the, all the Canaanite cities listed on the map, they were rivals. They didn't conquer one another, but they did have border skirmishes and conflicts with each other. And especially Shechem figured in a lot of them, but Jerusalem's involved too. So they are asking Pharaoh, Egypt, sort of to referee or come to the help of one of them. So this part becomes important because it shows us that not only was there not a kingdom of Israel, but that Jerusalem had no particular position of dominance over the other Canaanite cities. They were just one among many. Next, please. So just to summarize what we've been discussing so far, when Jerusalem was faced with external threats, it sought help from Egypt. Jerusalem held no leadership position over the Canaanite cities. Hebron, the future capital of David's kingdom of Judah, and Shechem, the future capital of Jeroboam's kingdom of Israel, were outside Jerusalem's sphere of influence. And differences or conflicts were expressed in political diplomacy through writing. So this gives you some sense of the world that existed in the land of Canaan at the onset of David's becoming king in Jerusalem. Next, please. So let's switch to Israel now, moving forward from the 1330s and 40s of Merneptah to the archaeology of, excuse me, of Amarna to the archaeology of Merneptah the Pharaoh who succeeded Ramses II, the traditional Pharaoh of the Exodus. And you see him on the left. On the right, you see Merneptah Stele, discovered in 1896. It was the first Egyptian mention of Israel by name. And in fact, it's the only Egyptian reference to Israel by name that we still have since 1896. There have been other discoveries particularly involving Assyria, where Israel had been mentioned by name, but those referred to the first millennium. Or Nepta, as you see here, 1212, 1202 BCE, still 200 years plus before David, and now we have Israel being mentioned. Next. Now in that stele, Merneptha claims he fought a campaign against Israel by name. On the left, you see a map of a reconstruction of what his battle route would be. Now, we don't know for sure, but this is the best guess. Where you see the word Israel there, and a little further south, that's where all those hill country settlements that I was talking about earlier would have been located. Those terraced farms, those four room houses. They were all, almost all of them located in that area and south towards Jerusalem. So that's what have been Israel. So in effect, you see Merneptah surrounding Israel as we think it, it exists. The, excuse me, the waters of Neptoa comes from some phrase in the book of Joshua, where it looks like that's a garbled form of Merneptah. That is, he was there, and we know from Egyptian records, he stopped at springs there. But somewhere in the game of telephone, as it were, where you're passing on information from one generation to the next, the name might have got a little garbled. But the odds are, and I think there's a consensus in biblical scholarship on this, that those waters of Neptoa refer to Merneptah, and it's where he had originally campaigned. So you see, Jerusalem is not exactly part of the battle in this campaign. So one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, what did these other Canaanite cities do during this campaign? Did they support Merneptah as a good vassal, meaning perhaps provide food for his troops, for the animals and so on? Or did they align with Israel and were anti-Egyptian? And specifically, what does that mean for Jerusalem? So when Merneptah has this campaign around 1212, you have decisions to make if you're in the land of Canaan as to where you stand. Next. 
Now I want to switch to a biblical text that may give us some insight. You see here in the parts in red, I'm not going to read the whole text, that we have a king of Jerusalem, Adonazetic. And he's organizing a coalition further down, you see, five kings of the Amorites. And the coalition is organized against Gibeon, the Canaanite city, one of those on the map before, because it had made peace with Israel. Now, I'm not suggesting that this text comes from the time of this, of Merneptah or shortly thereafter, but I do want to suggest that it involves a memory that goes back to that time period, that Jerusalem was opposed to Israel. And let's think about that for a minute. When we think of the Bible and we think of Jerusalem, that's the place where it's located. And now we have a story here where Jerusalem is an enemy of Israel. And it's allied with another Canaanite city because that had been an ally of Israel. So that makes you start to wonder, you know, why, what is this story doing in the Bible, where your capital city is, is not your ally, but an enemy? Next, please. So here's the next part of the text, slightly different. Joshua speaks to the Lord, Yahweh, and gives the Amorites. So Jerusalem's not mentioned there, it's just the collective term. But I want to highlight the area first in red. Sun, stand thou still at Gibeon, which we just saw in the previous slide, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And that's what happened. The Lord answered his prayer. So that supposedly is recorded, as you see in red, in the book of Yasher. And I would say that this kind of poetry or song, victory song, could easily date back to a time of an early conflict between Israel and these Amorites. One other area of interest there, as you see in red, there has been no day like it before or since. And that's a very striking comment too, because you might think, well, what about the Exodus? What about the Sea of Reeds? Wasn't that a great day? This text is placing what happened in the land of Benjamin, in the land, the city of Gibeon, at a higher level, so to speak, cosmically, religiously, that when Yahweh hearkened to our voice and fought for Israel, it was even greater than when he did so in the Exodus. That's the implication of this verse, which again is a striking comment to make. So it doesn't specifically mention Jerusalem, but it does, and in the previous slide, start to raise what is the relationship between Benjamin, where this battle took place, and Jerusalem, and the issue of the Song of the Sea. Next, please. You're looking at an annular eclipse from 2012. Now, we're all familiar with total eclipses and partial eclipses. Annular eclipses are rare. And as you can see here, there's like a corona around the entire moon. Some Israeli physicists went back and calculated this, and this you could do very precisely, because that's the way physics and astronomy works, that on October 30th, 1207 BCE, meaning during the reign of Merneptah, when this miracle at Yasher is supposed to have occurred, there was an annular eclipse in the valley. Now, I'm not suggesting that this annual eclipse caused one side to win or one side to lose, but I do want to suggest it was it became part of the memory of that, that cosmic events can stick in your memory and become associated with historical events. So unless somebody panicked, uh, I don't think it caused one side to win or not, but it is an event that occurred. Next, please. So just to summarize what we have here, there's no tradition of Jerusalem welcoming Israel. There's no tradition of Jerusalem being conquered, destroyed, or abandoned in the centuries between Amarna and David, between the 14th century and David around 1000 BCE. 
There is a tradition of Jerusalem being a loyal vassal to Egypt. And there is a tradition of Jerusalem turning to Egypt for help when threatened. If we had diplomatic correspondence from the time of Ramses II and Merneptah, it would show that Jerusalem supported Egypt. Next, please. So for over 350 years, the land of Canaan was occupied territory under Egyptian rule. Then Egypt withdrew, 1136. So now we're another 70 plus years after Merneptah. Now what? How would Jerusalem protect itself when it no longer was able to rely on Egypt to protect itself? Next, please. So now we're gonna to go to some more biblical texts to try to look at what happened. I'm sorry, we're gonna look at the archeological texts to look at what Jerusalem did. Next, please. So here you see an artist drawing of that stone step structure that I was talking about earlier. There is some controversy over the date. Now, many of them and most of them go along with this late Bronze Age, Iron One Age, 13th, 12th century date for the construction. Others would date it later. I like this earlier time period better because I think it makes more sense to me historically, as I was just alluding to in the previous slide. After 1136, Jerusalem is on its own. It has to provide for its own protection. That's when it builds the stone step structure and the next one, as far as I'm concerned. Next, please. So here you see the actual archeological excavation on the right, and you can see perhaps a person sitting there on the steps. <clears throat> to give you some sense of the scale. So this is part of what I'm suggesting is the fortification Jerusalem built once it was on its own and no longer could rely on Egypt for help and had all these Israelite settlements in the surrounding area. You have to realize, according to the Bible in Judges, which I don't have this book on the slide, now Benjamin had made an effort to conquer Jerusalem and had failed. So you did have a situation where you had all these settlements around there. Now, some scholars will take the position that those settlements belong to Jerusalem and it set that up as part of its defense. Others will say, no, those are part of Benjaminite settlements and they were threatening to Jerusalem as these new people who arrived became, uh, went closer and closer to the city, but were not able to conquer it itself until David. Next, please. And on top of that large stone structure, now you have this large stone structure as well. And you can see the person standing there. Next. So what can we learn from this? Well, the usual approach is to try to relate these to what's described in 2 Samuel 5, 9 that you see on the top. And David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city around about from the Milo inward. That this is the structure that those verses, that verse refers to. That this is something David sort of inherited by becoming the king of Jerusalem and of Israel in Jerusalem. That this is the structure. Next, please. So let's move ahead to some uh, biblical evidence about this time uh, when we don't have the archeological evidence, but we have some descriptions of what was going on in Jerusalem and David going there. Next. So these texts I'm not gonna read, but I have highlighted in red some pertinent information. First, the city is often referred to as Jebus. Of course, they didn't have parentheses and the commas like we do today, and that's added, but you see Jebus, that is Jerusalem, Jebus, that is Jerusalem, and then a reversal, Jerusalem, in Chronicles, that is Jebus. That would be like saying New Amsterdam, that is New York, New Amsterdam, that is New York, New York, that is New Amsterdam. So there's some recognition of these dual names for it, 
is still not quite clear exactly why it has these two names. There's no archeological evidence for the term Jebus or Jebusite outside of the Bible, but it certainly does exist within the Bible. And that's how they refer to the people there as Jebusites. You don't really see Jerusalemites in there. But the middle one, you see, it's the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel. So there you have your capital city in Jerusalem. You have people living there, and they're not Israelites. You're saying they're foreigners. And this is in the biblical text that we tend to associate as being written in Jerusalem. So again, that brings up this issue of relationships within the different uh, peoples in the kingdom and how they relate to each other. Next, please. Now, one important site that often is overlooked is this threshing floor. It belongs to a Jebusite, it's called Aruna. It's quite possible Aruna is not a personal name, but it's a royal name, it's the title of the king, like Pharaoh or Caesar. It's just called Aruna. And what makes this important here is this Aruna, this Jebusite, there's an altar there, or rather God calls David to build an altar there. And this goes to the importance of the threshing floor in ancient civilizations, ancient cities, that is easy to overlook. Next, please. So what the Bible is telling us is that David purchased this threshing floor. He did not seize it as a conqueror. He bought it as a legitimate purchase. So that's one reason why scholars say, well, this is a royal to royal negotiation where David as the new king on the block is purchasing a threshing floor from the current local king and he's going to put an altar there. Next, please. I added these two slides because I wanna show you the, or, or allude to the importance of the purchase. You have the one on the left, it's the older painting by Benjamin West from 1771, a century after the Quakers purchased land from the Delaware Indians. And then on the right, you have a later painting about an event much earlier, 1626, when the Dutch purchased Manhattan from the Lenape Indians. And you can certainly notice the similarity between the two paintings. So the younger one probably got the idea from the older painting. But the idea is that a purchase shows legitimacy, that you are not seizing land from somebody, but that you are buying it as in a normal contractual obligation. And therefore, it's, you're entitled to do that. It's not just a conqueror. We can debate what happened in Philadelphia. We can debate what happened in New York. We can debate what David did. I'm just giving you what the story is telling us, that there was the purchase. Now, why the big deal about the threshing floor? Next. I will just add, yes, the idea about did both sides of the two parts of the parties understand the same terms? The answer is probably not with the Lenape and the Delaware, who are actually also Lenape, but that doesn't really tell us about whether uh, uh, Aruna understood it or not. I'm sure he did as the king, because this would have been normal. Land purchases were normal back then. Solomon began to build the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So the land that we were just talking about that David purchased from Aruna eventually becomes the site of the temple, as you see in this passage from Chronicles. Next, please. The passage here comes from a classical scholar writing about Greek but I, uh, theaters, but I want to mention it because I think it relates to what we're dealing with in Israel as well. The oldest theaters were all situated in the vicinity of the sanctuary and in the temenos of it. In each theater, an altar was set up in the middle of the orchestra on which a sacrifice was made before and after the ceremony. The performance took place only once a year 
on the festival day of the God worship in the temple. The theater was a sacred place. The actor were sacred persons. Their action was sacred action and it was performed at a sacred time. So a threshing floor may not mean that much to us now, but we have to realize well, for the harvest, it's a big deal. This is when you give thanks for knowing you're gonna have food to the next harvest. That's where our Thanksgiving concept comes from. That you go there, you have a ceremony, it's a religious place, and this is why the continuity between it being a sacred place from Aruna to a sacred place under David, later becoming the temple. So when you came from those village, those small cities, those daughter cities with the market, with your harvest, with your grain, with your wheat, and have it threshed here, there would be a ceremony performed there. Next, please. So what else can we learn about the religion? Well, when we turn to Genesis 14, we see in the first line there, I didn't highlight it in red, there's a king of Salem. And scholars generally assume that that refers to Jerusalem. And that they worship God Most High, God El Yon. So it's an El Yon based name. Next, please. So in Canaan, we know there's Baal and we know there's El. We know in the Canaanite tradition that El had a wife, Asherah. So this leads to the likelihood that in Jerusalem, before it became an Israelite city, they worshiped El Yom, El, and Asherah. Next, please. So what can we learn now in summarizing David's Jerusalem? They had not been Israelite for centuries of Israel's existence. They were pro-Egypt and not anti-Egypt as Israel was. They quite probably were anti-Israel. They had no authority over other Canaanite cities and were viewed hostily by them. They worshiped El Yon, meaning Most High, and Asherah. And they continued to live in the city after David made it his capital. So there was no genocide. There was no de de deportation. The population of the capital remained mostly Jebusite for centuries until that northern refugee population came down, I mentioned earlier, after Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. And when we read about Benjamin's attempt in Judges 121 to try to conquer Jerusalem and failing to do so, the verse mentions that the Jebusites still dwell in the city. So whenever the verse was written, they're still there. And they dwell in the city with Benjaminites. So it was a much more cosmopolitan city with different political groups than it had been earlier. Next, please. So I'm gonna end with this idea when David becomes the king there, there were four bases of power. He as the king of the royal one, but the Jebusites were still around and they presumably had Zadok as their co-priest. The Benjaminites were still around and they presumably were pro-Saul, who was of course a rival with David. And the Levites were around and they had a co-priest according to the biblical text of David, Zadok. So Zadok and Abiathar were co-priests who became clear rivals after David died. Next, please. So I wanna thank you all for attending this lecture, for listening to me and turn it over now to questions. Start video, okay. Um, I hope you can all hear me now. I see the video hasn't been started yet. Uh, start my video. Um, I want to first thank Peter for an extraordinary lecture. I, we've all learned so much from you and with great appreciation. Uh, regrettably, some of you had problems, I gather, hearing my introduction. Uh, Mitch and Nadine, I sent it to be put under chat and they said it was just too long. 
but I know a number of you will want to re-listen to Peter's talk, and it will be later then. You'll be able to hear it. It'll be much louder. But what I basically said was I welcomed everyone. I spoke about Peter's extraordinary background. He has a doctorate from Columbia, and you've all seen it. Well, I'm holding up my copy of the book, and it's excellent. I have learned from this about different sources and information and background. So I recommend it very highly. Um, his doctorate's from Columbia, he has two masters from NYU, went to University of Pennsylvania for his bachelor's. Um, this lecture was supposed to be given last April and unfortunately COVID caused the shutdown of the club. But I'm delighted that it was presented now online because we had over a thousand people register for it. So I think that's excellent. And I thank the Arts Club for everything they've done during this difficult period to continue education about so many different subjects. I do have some questions I wanna to get to now um, from the committee first, and then we'll take some of the audience. Uh, Courtney said, you spoke about food grown in daughter villages. She'd be interested in knowing about the eating habits, primary food and drink. Unfortunately, that's not something I can speak to uh, very heavily. Uh, basically grains, there are vineyards. Uh, vineyards are a long-term crop, capital investment to grow, uh, to, to, to uh, return, to get the grapes and the olives and the uh, wheat and things like that. There are sheep, of course, and uh, animals like domesticated animals. But I, I'm not, I couldn't, and dates. I can't tell you too much though about uh, the food that they eat. Well, I think that gives us an idea though of the type of diet which they had, if those were their basic foodstuffs. Um, have there been, and this comes from Jody, any genetic studies? Uh, the relationship between the Jebusites, Israelites, other ancient people. And I was interested when you spoke about Nubians that he didn't mention. I assume there was some intermarriage or relationship. Starting with the Nubians, we don't know what happened to them after the um, Egyptians stationed there as garrison troops. Nubians served in the Egyptian military forces for centuries in many different battles all over the place. Uh, it, did any of them stay there? There's no way really of knowing that. Egyptians didn't give you that kind of detailed information. But it is possible that some did intermarry and stay there, but I have no information about that. Um, as far as DNA tests go, there's a lot more genetic DNA testing being done on the peoples there, including the Canaanite, what would be considered Canaanite people. You can't get fine-tuned into Jebusite or all these other groups. Um, it's just not possible. But the Canaanite people seem to have been come from multiple areas, including, uh, I'm trying to remember because I did read about it once. Uh, it's, it's only last year, it seems like a long time ago. Uh, beyond Northern Syria, and I'm not sure quite to the Caucasus, but they are a mixed group from different areas. Uh, there's been some Canaanite test, testing, uh, for example, in Phoenicia, in, in Lebanon, the Christians there consider themselves descendant of the original Phoenician Canaanites, whereas the Muslims they review in Lebanon as being part of the Muslim wave of conquest in the seventh century CE, so a, a much later time period. So there is work going on with, with the Canaanite DNA. And what is a when Peter says, I don't know, it probably means there hasn't been much published because he's a renowned authority on this topic. Someone asked, how long have you been a historian? Probably from almost birth that you've been fascinated by this. And I'm well, in some ways you're, you're quite right because when I was growing up, my father took the family on these trips up and down the coast of Eastern coast of the United States. 
and we would visit all the historical sites. We would go to the Liberty Bell and, and all the way down, I think maybe as far as South Carolina at that time when I was a kid. And uh, that's where I got my interest from history. I came right from him. Later on in high school, I read The Source by James Michener. And I'm sure some of the people in the audience have read that as well. And that's what steered me a little towards looking at the archeology span of history as well. Mm -hmm. Peter also has his own initiative, which is involved with history, which is instructional for school systems and the general population. Um, another question, was monotheism practiced by any of the peoples in Jerusalem before King David? No, there's nothing to indicate monotheism in the second millennium BCE in the land of Canaan. Uh, okay. Obviously, we have not figured out all these uh, temples and who they worship, but there's no suggestion from any of the stories that we have, the Baal or any of the temple structures. Some cities have more than one temple anyway. Uh, so there's nothing to indicate monotheism in the second millennium there. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, now for some of the other questions. The extrication texts, um, why were some of the texts not destroyed and some of the statues not destroyed? Well, all the execration texts are broken, they're fragments. Some of the fragments may be bigger than others, but these are all part of ritual ceremonies mm -hmm. where you curse people you want to assert your authority over mm -hmm. without actually having to send an army over them necessarily to do it for real. So they're all part of the ceremony. As I said, we don't know how far back that goes. Mm -hmm. We're just limited to what we happen to find from the accident of archaeology. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about Moses and the escape from Egypt. This is, and I think when you were talking about Joshua, that was related in time to Moses. Well, I mentioned Merneptah yeah. as 1212 to 1202 and his claim to destroy Israel. His father, Ramses, is the typical pharaoh of the Exodus. I did not get into that in this talk at all. It's not really directly related to Jerusalem itself. So I, what should I say, passed over it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, didn't, didn't really go into it. <laughs> all right, you got that, okay. <laughs> Um, but it would have been right before that. Mm -hmm. So many compliments as I'm going over this. Someone said that David entered through water tunnels. Well, there's a lot of debate. And I can't, so there's no definitive answer. How did David actually physically become the king of Jerusalem? And in the biblical accounts, it looks like he militarily took it. He seized it. And there's questions with some terms that people can't really translate, they're not sure of, but that maybe he climbed in through the water tunnels and uh, that's how he was able to conquer it from within. Mm -hmm. It's very Another clear. possibility that I would just wanna mention, it can't be proven, but it works better for me in a political sense, is that he made a deal. He made a deal with Aruna. He said, I will make your city the capital city of my kingdom, if you let me in, if you give it to me. So there was no real fighting about that. Uh, but that does, that's not an heroic story. You want your founder to have done something really heroic and military and successful, and you don't want to think of it as a negotiated a negotiation. Where Aruna said, it's best for us, we'll, we'll stay alive as a city, we'll keep going as a city, will be your capital. Here, come on in, take it. But, but we don't know. But again, the biblical text implies a military conquest of the city. Yes, that's true. Um, there's a question and I want to make a point about this and that's the Canaanites also came from Egypt. There was mass movements around 1200 BCE. There was movements also of people from, we'll call it the land of Canaan, whatever it actually is, but how Egypt sees it, with the Hyksos into Egypt, and eventually a battle that took place where the 
Egyptian ruling families uh, gained power once again from the Hyksos and began the 18th dynasty. Uh, could you perhaps say something about that, Peter? Well, the connections between Egypt, especially Lower Egypt, the Delta area, and what we call Canaan, go back to in the beginning, go back 5,000 years. There was always contact between them. And that differentiated Lower Egypt from Upper Egypt, further up the Nile, where um, it's less accessible to get to the land of Canaan from them. So it webs, it goes, I mean, it, it flows back and forth it's when one might be stronger than the other. Uh, the Hyksos represent a very particular event, a group, it's not an ethnic term, it's a Egyptian term referring to title, people who are kings of foreign lands. So there's no Hyksos ethnic migration or racial, racial migration into, into Egypt. Uh, so that would be after the time of the execration text and before Amarna. I will just say uh, they will be, <coughs> excuse me, featured more in my upcoming book, uh, Exodus, an Egyptian, an Egypt story, which I would be working on right now if I wasn't speaking to you. And uh, hopefully by the end of the year that will be published and out, then you'll have a chance to read more about the the Hyksos and their connection to the exodus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just ask one last question, if I can, because I know we should, and some of you have to go on, but these have been such interesting questions and a fascinating, important lecture that helps us put what's in the news into perspective. Was it commonplace for Israelites to build an altar on the threshing floor? And the person is interested in the connection between faith and thanks of God's provision. Um, and the physical harvesting and sorting of wheat from the chaff. Well, I would say the altar, I would say giving thanks for food mm -hmm. is simply part of the human experience. It doesn't matter whether you're on a hunt back in Paleolithic time, or you're in Neolithic times growing food that needs to be harvested. You give thanks for food, you give thanks to a deity. With agriculture, you do it in roughly the same position year after year. And then that becomes a sacred place where you have it. So for example, I live here in Westchester, we have a lot of mills, threshing mills, like Phillipsburg Manor. This is where the people would bring their food, their, their harvest to, to thresh in, in the fall. <clears throat> they didn't quite become religious sites because it was a business strictly for them. But back in Canaanite times when we're dealing with it, everything in, involves religion. There is, you don't really separate these things uh, the way we do today. So they would offer this, um, I don't think, no, there are plenty of altars that Abraham and the patriarchs erect, but they're not connected with harvest directly. They're not connected with threshing floors. They're where the patriarch may sleep or have a vision or have an encounter with the divine, and he erects an altar there to commemorate that. So that's a different kind of event. That's more like Merneptis Steely, when you're, you're a someone in charge and you want to commemorate an event, than it is an agricultural giving thanks event, which we don't really have a lot of information about. Uh, well, this has absolutely been fascinating. I know I've learned a lot from Peter over the years, and I think our attendees have as well from this lecture. And again, you may want to re-listen to it because it's just a wealth of information that you possess, Peter. And Thank I'm you. glad you shared it with all of us. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for making this possible.